Good evening. Welcome to the Live Arc. This is a show about art and modernity. And we are trying to trace the connections between where we are in the state of the arts in India today, 2022. In this larger umbrella, under this larger umbrella, we have this show called Being Artsy. And for this, my guest today is the very distinguished retired professor of physics, Dr. Bindu Bamba. Dr. Bamba has recently retired from the University of Hyderabad, uh, although that does not mean that her work in physics and particle physics in particular has in any way taken a backseat. Quite the contrary. You'll see why I'm saying this. When we first started talking about having this interview, uh, I'll call you Bindu if you don't mind. Uh, Bindu raised the question about an article, both she and I had read an article or an essay many, many years ago. The essay is called The Two Cultures. And it is against the backdrop of this essay that we're having our conversation today. I'll say a little bit about the essay since our audience may not be familiar with it. The essay, The Two Cultures, is by a thinker called C.P. Snow, a leading British novelist and a physical chemist. Snow gave an important public lecture at Cambridge University, which was broadcast on BBC in 1959, titled The Two Cultures, that is fairly relevant today, even 63 years later. I will summarize this essay before we discuss it uh, between us. Put simply, the two cultures theory states that there are two kinds of thinkers, those who have a scientific background and training and temperament, and those who have an artistic or non-scientific temperament. These two groups of people do not know each other, understand what the other is about, and most importantly, do not learn from each other. Scientists are optimists. They are, as Snow would say, they have the future in their bones, unquote. Because of the uses of sciences, technology, um, and industry, scientists believe they have alleviated material poverty, hunger, and physical deprivation. To a large extent, this is true. However, the moral, sociological, and psychological condition of humans is not their concern. They have not read much literature, nor do they take much interest in the cultural life of their society. The non-scientist is concerned with the cultural well-being of humans, our joys and sorrows, our understanding of our collective past, and our understanding of beauty. It is true, as Snow states, quote, in any country where they have had the chance, the poor have walked off the land into the factories as fast as the factories could take them in, unquote. Those are primary concerns. There are losses too, of course, one of which is that organizing a society for industry makes it easy to organize it for all out war. But the gains remain. They are the basis of our social hope. Snow makes a clear distinction between the industrial revolution and the scientific revolution. Scientists take it for granted that applied science is an occupation, a second, uh, sorry, Scientists believe and take for granted that applied science is an occupation for second-rate minds. Engineers and doctors are mechanics for machines and human bodies. This problem of the binary between the scientist and the non-scientist is even more prevalent in some countries than others. Britain and India, where the specialization sets in very early, are more prone to this divorce, the US and Russia less so. Snow says, and I quote, I don't pretend that any country has got its education perfect. The Russians and the Americans are both more actively dissatisfied with theirs. To this, I will add that Indians have not seriously examined their education system after independence, and they have paid, we have paid a huge price for this to date. The Chinese, because of their self-imposed isolation for many decades, have carved a somewhat different path. Suffice to say that the non-scientist has no understanding of the beauty of a science experiment, 
its exquisiteness, its quantum implications, because the non-scientist has no means of understanding. And Snow says, the worst crime is innocence, unquote. Closing the gap between the two cultures is a necessity in the most abstract intellectual sense, as well as in the most practical. When these two senses have grown apart, then no society is going to be able to think with wisdom. And here I end my summary. The question before us, Bindu, is, is it possible that science and art can be remarried again? Over to you. So um, let me start by uh, quoting uh, the legendary physicist Richard Feynman. So once he was having a, a, a talk, um, a conversation with his artist friend, and they were beholding a painting of a flower. So, uh, so what his artist friend told him is that, you know, I can perceive the beauty of this, but you scientists, you, when you examine it, it becomes a dull thing because you take it apart. So uh, Feynman disagrees with him and says that, you know, of course I can appreciate the beauty like you do, but for me, the beauty lies in taking the flower, um, flower apart and seeing how it works. What are the cells in there? What are the complicated actions inside? So that just adds to the beauty. As I go to smaller and smaller dimensions, I see the inner structure. I see the, the fact that the colors attract insects to pollinate it. Do, do insects see color? Uh, does this aesthetic sense exist in lower forms? Does aesthetic sense ex exist in insects? So a flower for me is a much more, um, uh, you know, a much more marvelous thing, a piece of beauty, because not only can I appreciate the beauty of it whole, but I can appreciate the beauty of its parts. So, it, so you know, so it's a question of what does one think is beauty? Is beauty just physical beauty, or is beauty understanding the aesthetics of the of the flower? And is the aesthetics of the flower just the full flower, or is it you know why it is? like that why it is like that what is the cause of its color what is the cause of its attraction what is the cause of its beauty isn't that aesthetics too so that is um that is the the most brilliant way we could have started this conversation and i will add another anecdote also by richard feynman uh, so feynman used to say that when he gets tired of looking at his physics problems he puts it away and what does he do? He goes to read the Arabian Nights. And it is the topsy-turvy, mischievous, um, phantasmagoric nature of the story of the Arabian he, he probably would read one story at a time. And it would refresh him so much that he would be able to look at the physics problem afresh. But I will say that not every scientist has the mindset of a rigid final. Would you agree? Uh, so I'm going to share with you uh, the, the, the art of, of an artist in Chicago who was inspired by the theory of Richard Feynman. So I'll just share, it, share the screen with you. Uh, and um, I'll just show you, uh, okay. And let me just go down to, uh, okay. So, uh, wow. so uh, let me just uh, make it a slideshow. Uh, okay. Um, wait one card. Okay. So, um, so you know, uh, this uh, artist called uh, um, Edward Taft. He has uh, written a book on the cognitive art of Richard Feynman. He developed these diagrams to show the interaction of electrons and uh, positrons and photons. And uh, so what he does is that he has um, looked at these uh, visualizations and developed a series of sculptures, which I will just show you um, because I, I couldn't uh, download them. Uh, so I will just show you these sculptures. Um, so, uh, can you see these? Uh, sure. 
uh, let me just, okay. So these are some of the sculptures. Um, if you recall, they, there was recently this sharing uh, is paused. Uh, why is it paused? I'm not and, sure. I'm not sure. Let me um, I can, share. I can it. see it on my screen. Okay, let me let me go again. Okay, so you can see these diagrams, right, on your screen? Yeah. 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 So these are the Feynman diagrams. They are made, uh, They are uh, sculptures of the Feynman diagrams. They are made with a uh, wire. Okay, and these particular Feynman diagrams are in a paper describing the latest discovery at Fermilab, which was the uh, which was announced. It was the muon magnetic moment discovery, um, the higher order correction. So these are all those, and they have been. Uh, you know, it, he was inspired by Feynman to make these diagrams and now they are at Fermilab. So this is just an example of the fact that not only did uh, Feynman's artist friend uh, take his, uh, uh, his words to heart, but then he replicated Feynman's uh, science into, into art also. So uh, that's what, uh, uh, that's what I, I like to say that, you know, that, it, when we have these conversations, we must translate them into action also somehow, you know, and uh, so it's not only just a sculpture and painting, but also music and uh, music and poetry um, is also, uh, you know, thought to be, you know, diverging from physics, but, or, or sciences, but it isn't, you know, you can, you have, you can have a symbiotic relationship between the two. Unfortunately, in our country, very often we have two streams of thought, the humanities yes. and the sciences, and yes. they don't meet. And uh, because we don't have an education system which, which, uh, which emphasizes on cross-fertilization uh, cross of, of uh, the, sciences, the sciences and the humanities. And uh, so the things are changing a little bit now. Uh, uh, but the thing is that it is always an imposed diktat. Like the UGC has told us we have to teach these foundation courses. In yes. which somebody from the science takes courses from the arts and somebody from the arts take courses from the science. But the students just think of it as an imposition. Yes. They're conditioned by society, you know, and they say, okay, what, they, uh, what will I get out of this? What will, how will this help me find a job? Yes. And so that, that so this whole mentality is towards you know um, am I just uh, studying this for the uh, for getting my credits or is it enriching me in some way or the other? And yes, in fact, to go back to the uh, government's new education policy 2020, there's so much emphasis on arts integration. Arts integration, you know, every few paragraphs there is a reference to arts integration, and. Um, uh, I've had some experience with this, you know, talking to teachers and, and students uh, at the high school level about how the hell do we integrate the arts. It's almost as though it is an afterthought. And as you said, the students are not in, interested. And really, it, it seems fairly difficult to integrate the arts once the student or the scientist's mind starts to. Uh, work in a scientific way. The science student cannot appreciate a poem or a doha of Kabir, and vice versa, the uh, art student cannot appreciate the beauty of uh, uh, an experiment. I mean, to say that an experiment has beauty yeah. almost seems like a contradiction in terms. So uh, let's talk about how you and I, I mean, I have not studied science since eighth grade in school. Um, and I'm trying very hard to understand the, the complexities of quantum physics, quantum mathematics in you know, different dimensions. And believe me, it is really taxing my mind. So uh, how, how can we proceed, you and I? How can we have a conversation? So I teach a course uh, and it is on, um, it, it, it's on the poetry of physics and the physics of poetry. And I follow this book. Uh, it's called The Poetry of Physics uh, and the Physics of Poetry. Wow. Okay. And uh, I have to read this. Uh, so what, what we do is we try to strip physics first of the mathematics because that is what is the most daunting in, uh, yeah. 
in physics because the language of physics is mathematics, but we try to strip it off that and explain concepts. And we also use the, uh, in, the in the period of enlight European enlightenment, for example, there was, uh, there was a lot of exchange of, uh, uh, in, in a similar way to C.P. Snow, what C.P. Snow is saying, there was some exchange between the two cultures. For example, when uh, Newton discovered, uh, uh, you know, when Newton, uh, you know, uh, pushed for the discovered gravity or, you know, the force of gravity, then uh, Pope wrote, nature and nurtures law lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be and all was <laughs> <laughs> That is awesome. That's the most awesome thing I've heard. Um, and I, I've not studied Newton. I've only studied Pope. But uh, knowing Pope in the way that I do, uh, this makes so much sense, you know. But we are several hundred years away from Pope. And in India, where knowledge was not as bifurcated as, let's say, in Europe uh, post-Renaissance, uh, here also, we are finding it difficult to go back to an integrated understanding of knowledge. Yes, how many people would be so lucky as to take a course with you on the poetry of physics and the physics of poetry? Um, and uh, let me put the problem or, or the conundrum in a different way. So I'm saying that it is not possible to live in these two mutually exclusive worlds and i have a hunch again it's just a hunch that uh, perhaps this uh, this reconciliation this remarriage of once divorce disciplines uh, is at the very crux of what i want to call modernity there's a certain tension in it but that tension needs to be resolved you know it, there has to we have to strike a a, ball, a reconciliation. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of uh, unpopular view here okay. uh, in the sense that I think that, you know, we had this Macaulay, Macaul Macaulayization of education in the colonial yes. period, right? Yes. And, and, and that sort of uh, split our understanding of different fields. You know, we, we yes. had subject classifications now, I don't agree uh, with, uh, with some of the proponents saying everything was written in the Vedas, but you know, we can learn from the Vedas. We can learn from a scientific method which is alien to the West in the sense that in the, in the Vedas, for example, you know, science and poetry are really married together. I mean, it's yes. that's the philosophy, not science, because science as we understand it has to be subject to experimentation, but let us say natural philosophy. Yes. So natural philosophy and poetry, okay, they are embedded together. And all, are, for example, in, even in Bhaskaracharya's work, all the theorems like Pythagoras' theorem, quote unquote, which is written in verse. And uh, they, uh, even we have a heliocentric theory uh, that has been unveiled by some scholars in, in, um, in, in Chennai. And it is uh, that of the Madhavacharya school in Kerala and the Neil Country School in Kerala, which, which takes mathematical formulas, which derives it from the, from the poetic text, you know? Wow. And they have found mathematical formulas, uh, which Newton, which are attributed to Newton, but were 200 years earlier. But you have to extract it from poetry. So in that way, you know, uh, I, I, I'm just saying that knowledge of a different scientific system yeah. Uh, which is not alien to us. Yes, uh, we, uh, it contributes to um, to science, and it's not only just in the Vedas, but also in Arabic. Um, in, in you know, in Arabic history, there uh, there is uh, Al Hazen. He Al Hatham and his he was the first person to attribute that light does not emerge from the eyes, but falls on the eyes, and things like that. Experimentation. So. I mean, it's not as if the merging of science and arts is alien to our culture. It's because it is it was alien to the Western culture and that was imposed upon us that we have this dichotomy. 
Yes. But I think we can, uh, even though, you know, uh, people think it may be regressive if we, if we go back to our ancient texts, but we can learn from them, I think. Yes. And I do emphasize it in my course. I say I'm emphasizing it not to tell you that we knew everything, but that we did have a different way of thinking. Yes, it was all in complete agreement with you. I'm not one of those who is opposed to uh, uh, going back to the Vedas uh, uh, because there's been a gap in our understanding of them or that they're in a different language or that we may now be approaching them through a different epistemology or way of knowing. Yeah, yes. we, we may read the Vedas not in a in a religious way but in a scientific with a scientific temperament and not only the vedas i mean later uh, also sanskrit the writings of various schools um, okay yeah it it is uh, I, I think it is important uh, because uh, for most of my life i have thought of science as originating from the greeks and it being basically you know a, a western method of thinking that we adopt but Lately, I, I found that uh, that we have uh, our own uh, scientific method that we had, and we never developed it, of course. But yeah. but uh, but there is a, there is some merit in knowing about it, and in some merit yes. in teaching it also. I couldn't agree with you more. However, uh, I would say that um, the pedagogy that we might use now to uh, get to this uh, uh, kernel of, of science, uh, it has got to be a little different. So uh, the, the ancient texts and the science that they developed was not based on experimentation. Yes, exactly. It was not based on experiment, observation, verification, experiment-based yeah. observation, etc. Perhaps, and I, I'm just conjecturing, perhaps there was a flash of insight. And Ramanujan is perhaps the best example of this. Yeah, that is true. But that, that is a very mysterious uh, example, that of Ramanujan, okay. because he kept on saying that he was inspired by a goddess and, yes. and, and so on. That is, uh, 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 but you know, that I cannot explain, but um, uh, in regards to experimentation, for example, uh, uh, it was not all just flashes of insight. It was um, some observations uh, also, because, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, Shushuta developed this procedure of cataract surgery uh, in which he put, um, he, he could cure the cataracts by putting in uh, grease, uh, animal grease, you know. So, and he did it again and again and again. And I think that uh, in medicine, I think it was a question of repeating again and again and again and True. statistically seeing the efficacy. So it's sort of a method of induction is what we call it, you know. Right. So, but we did not have the method of deduction from induction in the sense we could do many instances, yeah. but we did not derive a general principle from it in that sense. Okay. So, so the deduction part, um, in, in the sense that this drug works, like in yeah. Ayurveda, but, in why Ayurveda. Does it work? but why does it work? That we could not, we, we yeah. could not do that because that is only something we would get through experimentation. Right. Right. It would work, right. So right. a controlled experiment. So in that sense, but you know, I think that uh, uh, it is important for uh, scientists and humanities uh, people to get together and, you know, uh, I disagree with snow in the context of India. In the context of India, I think technologists are admired more than scientists. <laughs> uh, in, in the sense that everybody wants to get into IIT uh, yes. and do engineering and, and science has become a fallback for those who don't get into engineering for a lot yes. or medicine. So in, in India, it's not that the the uh, technologists and the doctors are thought of as second class, it's the scientists more. Who, who get the back back seat? So it's a bit different here than um, than. True, but but it is the scientists of India that have won the greatest acclaim uh, on the world stage, not the technologists, not the industrial innovators and inventors. So uh, I want to give due credit to the Indian scientists who actually, you know, 
been phenomenally successful. Uh, we could both name a few. So moving forward, uh, let's talk about this new kind of modernity that I'm trying to conceptualize. Uh, I, I hate the idea that we in India uh, are always uh, kind of seen as the afterthought of modernity. It happened in Europe and then it came to India, it, uh, whether it's in the arts or in uh, painting or in architecture or whatever. You know, we are always saying, oh, Jamini, Yamini Roy uh, was the modernist of India after Bauhaus or, or whatever. And um, it, it, this, this indicates to me a, a seminal or a germinal inferiority complex. So instead of, uh, you know, uh, being a footnote to that modernity with a capital M in the 40s and 50s, I want to say, let's be brave enough to conceptualize our own modernity right now and put it in circulation with modernity as it is being formed, let's say, in other parts of the world, including the global south. I don't want to use Europe and America or the West as the sounding board, right? So yeah. I haven't thought this through. In fact, my entire big project is about, you know, what would be Indic modernity? So help me think this through. Do you think that this uh, notion of remarrying the arts and the sciences uh, could be one of the facets of uh, what we might call a, a homegrown modernity? Okay, so I, I will answer your question, but before that, I want to play for you something. Sure. That my, my, uh, I have a friend, uh, she's retired many years ago, Chanchal Obroy in the Institute of Science, and she's a plasma physicist. She's also a singer. Uh, and she, what she did was she used to study solar waves. So what she did was she set her ragas to the solar sounds because there's a plasma in the sun. So the type of, um, the type of uh, music made when uh, sound waves travel through the plasma is different from that on earth. So she tried to do that. And um, I'll just play some uh, a part of that and then, and then I'll, uh, see tell you how it is relevant here so you see these are um, electromagnetic emissions of i think i seem to have lost your uh, uh, sound window Uh, sorry, yeah. I, I, I don't think uh, I'm sharing, right? Okay. Uh, just a second. Uh, just a second. Sorry about that. Am I sharing? No. Uh, no, I'm not sharing. I'll share. Sorry. Uh, okay, I'll start. given you some uh, idea of, uh, you know, of uh, some of the things which, which people do, but which are not appreciated. I mean, this was, she, she did it, she sang, she played the Veena to the, to the frequency of the, uh, uh, the waves to the, to the uh, solar atmosphere and uh, various uh, other natural phenomena that occur and the, the type of atmosphere changes. So since the atmosphere changes, the sound also changes. And she could find out the frequencies of those and reproduce it through Indian. And she, she, she found that the Indian ragas were much more effective in reproducing that than Western 
classical music. So there are many things that we can actually investigate as to why this is so, et cetera. Why did we get the, the raga system that we did? Was, were we inspired by, by natural frequency waves and things like that? So, you know, there is a lot that we can do with our indigenous art, you know, which is, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, which will, which has a scientific basis and vice versa. So, and so maybe uh, we need to uh, theorize some of the basic precepts of science uh, as well in order to um, accommodate our music to science and our science to our music. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm struggling for words because this has not even occurred to me uh, uh -huh. thus far. Well, you um, know, if you understand the concept of sound and how it depends on the medium through which it travels, then you can understand the concept of how music will change if the medium changes because the sound changes. So wow. in that sense, how do waves travel, sound waves travel through a material medium? If you understand that, then you can also understand how music would change if the atmosphere changed and you can test it out and create new music. So it gives rise to new music. So are there such concerts of such music or uh, pedagogy of this kind of music or students of this kind much. of music? Not that much. I mean, because neither the music department nor the physics department seem to have a sort of understanding with each other. Uh, uh, we did get uh, we did get some response from the uh, from the school of dance. You know, they were able to because there is a whole physics of dance. You know? Of course. And uh, so we were able to uh, have them uh, do a sort of a scientific ballet which was very interesting. We did it for the women's conference that I held in University of Hyderabad. And uh, so then they reproduced things like the discovery of radium and things through dance. And uh, we have a, uh, I have a very good uh, colleague called Madhurima and she is a dancer. And so she actually, uh, you know, translates the mechanics of dance into, you know, uh, the mechanics of dance she explains with respect to various dance steps that she does. She will explain to you what is the moment of inertia of those, what is the, you know, rotational velocity, etc. How how all the forces are at play, what the body does to make those forces be at play. So so these are you know there are so many different avenues one can explore, but because we do not have this dialogue uh, between the two um, disciplines. We just don't get anywhere. And one of the reasons is because we are assessed too much on our publications, you know? So people are just obsessed with publishing. And since people are obsessed with publishing, these type of new ideas, they, you know, they won't, uh, uh, they won't advance your career. They will just advance civilization, but that people don't seem to uh, care about. People are mostly, Thank and you. is it is it a coincidence that you and I are having this conversation when you're retired and I'm retired and we're not <laughs> worrying about our careers anymore or, our, or the publications on our resumes? Yeah. Uh, but that apart, uh, I have a friend who I'm going to interview in a couple of weeks. He's a, a, a musician. Uh, he plays the, well, he plays several instruments and he strings uh, uh, ragdari music. Uh, who has also trained uh, in uh, sound uh, in a physics kind of sense. So he trained at the uh, California Institute for the Arts as a sound recording specialist. And he's very conversant with computers. And so he's able to create a software uh, which captures the nuances of our komal and our tivr uh, swar uh, in Hindustani music. Uh, in a way that only the human voice thus far could have done. But because he's teaching remotely, he's uh, based in Ireland, but he teaches in the US, in Europe, as well as in India, he has been able to uh, create patches and put them on his software 
in a way that he personally does not have to reproduce those sounds. He can create them on an instrument on a computer and send them to his students so that rather than sit in front of the guru for X number of hours, they can play it themselves and you know learn to hear it before they can reproduce it. So I think it is absolutely radical. And in fact, a couple of days back, I was talking to him on the phone and I told him about this interview that I was going to do with you. And he suggested that we have a three-way conversation. So maybe there will be a part two to this art, science, and modernity uh, experiment. But I want to also ask you, are there some pitfalls to this uh, line of thinking and you've hinted at one in the sense that uh, you, you, you've suggested that there is a school of thought that says you know we don't need to study this science that is prevalent right now it has all been done before and there is a certain nationalistic pride that goes with it and i want to um, caution against that do you want to yeah. say some more yeah i really want to caution against that so whenever i do teach history of science, I say to the students that the only reason I am telling you these uh, examples are to, uh, to show you that science is not alien to Indian thought, that, yes. you know, that the process of reasoning is not something that we have acquired from the West or from yes. the Greeks. We had an intrinsic process of reasoning, and that is how you should take these, in, uh, you know, these ancient texts, just to build up your confidence that you are not doing something that is alien to your culture, that's all. Uh, you have a sense of connection with science uh, through, through this. That's all I, that's the only reason why I teach, uh, teach some of this. I don't say that it's all been done before because if it's all been done before, then why are we in the position we are in? Why do we have poverty? Why do we have you know droughts? Why do we have all these things? So what was the point of, it all having been done earlier if we haven't been able to capitalize on it. So, uh, you know, so it's, it's all very well to say it's all been done before, but what is the use of saying that if you are not going to just use it to bolster your future rather than sink into the past? Well said, sink into the past is indeed, absolutely, well said, well said. This is a, a good takeaway from, um, how has this uh, line of thinking uh, been received uh, in other scientific cultures and centers of science? Um, you know that even in my own faculty, when this course is, uh, the, the course that we teach is considered to be something which is superficial. I mean, there many people have said, you know, you spend, do you spend the time storytelling? you know and what good is it uh, and and so um, then we allowed physics students uh, for, uh, for some time in the course and the physics students said you know we've always done things without thinking about it and what your course has done is made us think of why uh, why what we are doing is important you know and so um, so i i really that was the take home that some of the physics students gave me from the course and some of the people, for example, I had students from the Sanskrit department and they were thrilled because they said, okay, this is a line of inquiry that we can pursue now, uh, scientific um, uh, sort of, you know, reasoning in, in Sanskrit literature is, is, is a research topic we can pursue. So, and that would be really good because they will get the publication also from it <laughs> and, 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 and so on. So I, I think that such courses uh, should be introduced and they should be, uh, you know, they, they should be introduced at the high school level itself. I think that at the high school level, all we are doing is trying to get into, uh, pass these entrance tests, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but we can always incorporate the history of science or the methodology of science as part of the high school curriculum for everybody, arts uh and science students. And then the philosophy of science. And the Absolutely. philosophy, which is very important, you know. Absolutely. It's like falsifiability. Um, is very important, especially when our whole society makes such absurd generalizations, you know. For, ex <laughs> for example, I love this principle called modus tollens, which is 
A implies B. If not B implies not A. So if you want to test the fact that all um, uh, that you know um, all Indians are good at math, okay? People say that, right? So let us look at not the question. If you are not good at math, so A you're not an Indian. All Indians is A. B is good at math. So B not B not B means not good at math means you're not Indian. That's exactly. Third. So you can take any generalization and you can, you know, apply this principle of modus tollens, which, uh, and, and you can, you can, you can, uh, you can tear it apart, you know, yeah. um, for example, all humans breed. If you don't breed, you're not human. That is actually <laughs> right. Okay. So, <laughs> so. Uh, Bindu, you know. we're uh, close to coming to our, uh, uh, interviews end, but uh, you had shown me uh, a visualization of the My kind of work your own work has been rendered into. Yeah. Uh, it would be a pity if we didn't get a taste of that. Could you I show just, us some? I'll just show you that. You know, I uh, I look for neutrinos, which are particles which are everywhere, the second most abundant particles, but you, they don't interact with anything. But we have detectors that uh, that look for this, and then we. They leave tracks in, in our equipment, uh, electronic tracks, which we then convert into uh, signals for the processes by which neutrinos interact. So I'm going to show you, uh, I do, um, I, uh, I'm going to show you the example of a signal, and then I'm going to show you how beautiful it is. The color coding is uh, energies of the various uh, particles that are produced in the atmosphere. So I'm just going to show you that, and then I'm going to show you an installation. Okay, then let me just. Uh, okay, so this is uh, my screen. This is uh, this is the example of all the particles that are produced when a cosmic ray, uh, 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 due to cosmic ray showers in the atmosphere. The cosmic rays being uh, being particles that come from uh, from cosmic sources like. Um, like stars and, uh, and supernovae, etc. So can you see the, and each of the color coding is uh, dependent on the energy of the particle. And this is a typical display. And then what we analyze this display to find out what are these particles. So it, it's, it's a thing of beauty, right? <laughs> can you see that? Absolutely. And, yeah. and uh, then I'll show you an installation. Um, uh, so, um, uh, I'll just show you an installation that was uh, commissioned by uh, by CERN, and it's it's a set of wires which are electrically charged. So every time a particle from the cosmic rays hits it, it creates a shower, and it was done by two artists who are called semiconductor. Okay, so it's an immersive digital um, installation, and it's what is happening inside the the that big machine, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And this is the installation, okay? This is one event. So this will go away and then another particle will come in the, and, and, and deposits it, its energy in the wires and the wires will light up. So it's a, it's a dynamic installation. Wow. And this and, is an event. And isn't it uh, the CERN laboratory in Switzerland uh, where there is this huge representation of the Nataraj yes. uh, doing uh, the, the cosmic dance uh, yeah. out of which all matter arises. Yeah. Uh, very few people in India know that, you know, this was a, a, a met the, the dance of Nataraj as metaphor for the creation of the universe yes. uh, or the cosmos. Um, that stands most prominently in front of the uh, CERN laboratory. Uh, building, which I think is uh, the greatest homage one can pay to the, um, the, the the metaphor of the Nataraj dance rather than the um, uh, the religious symbolism yeah. of it. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, just uh, stop sharing now. Okay, so this, I, I just wanted to give you a, an example of the fact that, you know, we create art in the lab every day. <laughs> And th that that thing could be something by Jackson that Jackson Pollock painted that uh, event. So <laughs> oh, that is so awesome that you create art in the laboratory every day, and uh, that you connected to a Jackson Pollock painting uh, is 
the finest uh, concluding line that we could have for this conversation. I want to thank you for the most amazing insights, Bindu. I hope that we will continue this conversation. We've only just started. Thank you so much. It was so enjoyable. I was so nervous, but I'm feeling good. Oh, you will never speak about me talking to a scientist. I don't even know what E is equal to MC squared means. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Goodbye.